This is CBC Here and Now. Well, excitement is building for this year's Canada Winter Games as athletes from Team Newfoundland and Labrador rally at the Powerplex in St. John's. We'll have live coverage from that event coming up. Here in mainland on the port of port peninsula there is a blockade set up because concerned citizens are saying their water supply is affected by construction somebody will get sick if this water system is not cleaned up we'll have that story coming up in 2023 food bank usage is expected to rise all across canada and st john's is no exception so bridges for hope is hosting a benefit concert to try to offset some costs. Their predictions are not just for us, but all across Canada, that food bank usage is gonna go up about 30% next year. I'm Jeremy Eaton, I'll have that story coming up. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. Private ambulance workers are now officially considered essential. The law is passed and now the 120 ambulance workers with fewers have to go back to work. Here and Now's Peter Cowan is on this story from our newsroom. So Peter, what happened? Well, Carolyn, it was a late night at the House of Assembly last night as MHAs debated the legislation, but after a few small tweaks, it passed. Moved and seconded that the said bill be now read a third time. It is a pleasure that I should adopt the motion. All those in favor? Yay. All those against? Motion carried. And as you okay, heard there, everyone in the legislature voted in favor of the legislation, but it wasn't around until around 7 o'clock this morning that it received royal assent and actually became law. So what does this all mean for ambulance services? Well, Eastern Health says all regular ambulance service has resumed as of 10.30 this morning. Western Health says in Stephenville, paramedics were back on the job before 9 a.m. and by mid-morning, all services in Central also resumed. But this isn't the end of the dispute. After they figure out who exactly is essential, the union could go on strike again as long as some members stay on the job in order to cover off emergencies. The union says they're expecting the only way to, they'll be able to reach a deal is through binding arbitration. So there are still a few more twists and turns for this labor dispute still to come. Carolyn? Thanks so much, Peter. Well, speaking of concerned residents, the people of mainland on the port of port Peninsula say road construction in their community is harming their water supply and they want it to stop. Citizens are blocking a road used to access a test site for wind power. A contractor working for World Energy GH2, the company proposing the development, has not accessed the site in a week. Here now is Troy Turner was there and has this report. It's day eight and protesters continue to block a road leading up to the supplementary water supply. Ditches along the road feature temporary filtration systems with bales of hay and a screen draped across the running water. Snow covers the 20 or so filter systems this week, but last week the flowing water was visible. What's coming down is not fit to drink. We have an all grade school here in our community, a lot of small children. That water was going to them as well. Somebody will get sick if this water system is not cleaned up. Zita Hinks says there's overwhelming opposition to the wind power development in the area. But this is different, she said. It's about the health and safety of residents, she says, and it can't continue. We're asking the government, why, why are you doing this to our water supply? It's not fair. It's inhumane because the way we feel, water is the very basic necessity of life. The government cannot deny us a good drinking water source. The water flowing from the mountains and into LaCointe's brook is not used throughout the year. It gets pumped up into the main reservoir when the primary source is shallow. In the heart of winter, winter especially, the reservoir goes low. There's little precipitation, there's a lot of freezing, and it's generally end of January, early February. Uh, it's often uh, activated in July and August again because of dry periods of the year. And it is not a secondary water supply. It is actually part of our water system. Dwight Cornick has been often on the local service district committee since 2009. When the pump house was installed in the late 1990s, he said the area around LaCointe's Brook should have been designated a protected area. When does government uh, subsidize 
funding for community projects without having done its due diligence. So uh, stating that it is not officially part of our water supply system, I believe it is an omission on the part of the government of Newfoundland and Labrador and I believe that they should be held accountable for this. Cornick says an application has been made with the Provincial Environment Department to have the area deemed protected and off-limits to construction. He's waiting for a reply. World GH2 would not do an interview. In a statement, the company said it is carefully following provincial guidelines. To help prevent storm water runoff from contributing to turbidity in the brook, we have put best management practices in place, including mitigations such as a silt fencing and check dams surrounding the access road. The company also said it is offering to improve all water supplies in the area. We are committed to being a good community partner and to bringing tangible benefits to the area as the local service district awaits answers from the provincial government, the people blocking the road, the concerned citizens, say they are also in a bit of a waiting game and they are not going to move until construction stops. Troy Turner, CBC News, Mainland. Well, meanwhile, the province's Department of Environment and Climate Change would not do an interview. They told CBC News that they're working on providing a written response. <laughs> Well, the snow that fell the last couple of days certainly took a big dent today as we saw lots of rainfall uh, this afternoon as well as mild temperatures in place as well. We've got an area of low pressure. That's what's bringing that southerly flow. The snow uh, across parts of Labrador will end as the low pulls away. So those snowfall warnings have since ended. But if we zoom out, you can see lots of cold air thanks to a ridge of high pressure in place in pretty much in place across Canada. That's going to head towards Labrador over the next couple of days. And then our next big weather maker is getting itself together in the southern states and that will move in as we head into Thursday and eventually into Friday. Here's the rainfall amounts over the last uh, 24 hours. Well, since yesterday anyway, Burgio took the top spot at 47.2 millimeters of rain really all along the south coast, somewhere between 20 and 40 millimeters fell. And then as far as the metro area goes uh, between 15 and about well 10 and about 20 millimeters the story so we'll see more of that where that came where there's more of that to, uh, to come as we head through the week I'll get into the details coming up thanks Ashley well we have a new development to tell you about in the story of Lisa Driscoll the woman who allegedly faked her nursing credentials to work at at least four long-term care homes on the island. Now, police announced today that Driscoll is facing a wide range of charges in St. John's and Gander. Here now's Ryan Cook has more. Three counts of fraud, three counts of identity theft and one for perjury. Lisa Driscoll is facing serious charges. The RNC confirming today they've been looking at Driscoll since June when she was flagged for working at Chancellor Park in St. John's. By that time, she'd already worked at Lane's and Kenny's Pond. All of that, police say, without having a nursing license. We know that Lisa Driscoll has gone by several other names, including Lisa Strickland. That was her name in Hamilton, Ontario in 2017 when her four-year-old son died. She was sentenced to two and a half years for criminal negligence and lost her license as an LPN. Now, we know that she moved to Newfoundland after her prison sentence ended in 2021, and it's alleged she quickly and illegally found work as an LPN from March of that year until last July. By August, Driscoll had moved to Gander. Central Health blew the whistle in December, saying she worked 25 shifts at Lakeside Homes, this time as a registered nurse. On top of identity fraud charges from that stint, she's also accused of theft under $5,000. The RCMP say she was stealing prescription drugs from residents at Lakeside Homes. Driscoll had a brief court appearance this morning. She called into the courtroom from the lockup, telling the judge she has COVID. She'll stay tonight in the lockup and she'll have a bail hearing tomorrow morning. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's.
Well, still with the courts, a man accused of sexually assaulting a woman last summer will not be going to trial. A St. John's court has ruled that he's not mentally fit to stand trial and unable to understand the basics of the court proceedings or the crime itself. Police were called to Bowering Park around 3.30 in the afternoon on July 25th. A woman reported that a man jumped on top of her and asked for a hug. She said that she fought him off. Police charged him with sexual assault but noted that he had an apparent cognitive delay. Well, today, a forensic psychiatrist testified the 23-year-old has autism and that he's predominantly nonverbal and childlike. The case will now proceed to a mental health review board. Well, chatter over the proposed Beta Nord oil project is intensifying once again. Equinor is engaging heavily with contractors and talks between the company and the province over a benefits agreement are ongoing. But now labor unions are raising red flags. They're concerned that very little construction work will take place in this province. Here now is Terry Roberts reports. It's called Build Right Here, a campaign launched by the powerful Trades NL, an umbrella group for 16 labor unions. Its members have a long and proud history of building oil projects in the province, but there are worries Bay de Nord could be different. Equinor's position is that they intend to construct the entire FPSO outside of the country. Equinor's massive deepwater Bay de Nord project has the potential to deliver billions in revenue and create much needed jobs in the construction sector. Despite the best efforts of environmental groups to scuttle the project, Bay de Nord received federal environmental approval last spring. Equinor has said formal sanction could come within a year or so, with first oil by the end of the decade. Another big milestone, a benefits agreement with the provincial government. Talks are ongoing. This is not a Norwegian project that this is a Newfoundland and Labrador project. The lead minister refuses to disclose any details of those talks, but says the province is taking a firm position. The oil stay in the ground if it's not the right benefit for us. But Trades NL says it's seen enough evidence to suggest skilled trade workers could lose out. When you read these expressions of interest, it, it's very clear that their intention is to do um, from our perspective at least, the, the, the entire work outside the province. If it were to happen, uh, it would be devastating. I mean, it, it, it's basically a loss of, you know, upwards of a thousand jobs, maybe as many as 1,500. Bay de Nord is a collection of oil discoveries, some saying up to one billion barrels. So Equinor is proposing a very large ship-like production vessel for the field, similar to those already used in the White Rose and Terra Nova fields. It's not possible to construct the hull here. But in the past, 70 to 90 percent of the topside work was completed at places such as Bull Arm and Marystown. So Trades NL is calling on businesses and citizens to support the government in its talks with Equinor. The goal is, though, is when it comes to topside modules and other work, subsea, we want what we can have here. No one from Equinor was available for comment, but in a statement, a company spokesperson said it is too early in the development for Equinor to have concluded on project construction and fabrication planning. Equinor is committed to investing in the communities where we operate. Trades NL says it will fight hard to ensure Equinor lives up to that commitment. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the Muskrat Falls transmission lines have malfunctioned again, and tonight Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro is trying to figure out why. Tens of thousands of people on the island lost power for up to an hour last night. There were two trips affecting parts of St. John's, Cornerbrook, Stephenville, and the Buren Peninsula. The first one involved a transmission line near Stephenville and the Maritime Link. The second happened as that link was being brought back online. It's the latest in a series of failures for the lines connected to the Muskrat Falls mega project. Well, we're only a few weeks into the new year, but one St. John's food bank has already experienced its busiest day ever. It's expected that demand for food banks will continue to rise in 2023, and Bridges to Hope is looking for cash to help stock its shelves. With COVID rules gone, it's hosting a fundraising show with some big musical acts. Here now is Jeremy Eaton explains. Another busy day for the volunteers at Bridges to Hope. The new year is still fresh, but demand for food is soaring. We had our busiest week ever. We did, uh, we did about 350 people last week. Um, you know, we're seeing so many new people, right? 
a trend they've been seeing here lately. Demand for these hampers is expected to rise. Their predictions are not just for us, but all across Canada, that food bank usage is going to go up about 30 percent next year. Food isn't cheap these days, making it more challenging to fill these boxes. I'm looking at it going about $70,000 in deficit right now. Um, so, and that's, but now after next week, last week, I'm actually scared that that's going to be more, to be honest with you. Bridges for Hope doesn't get any government funding, so it's gotten creative to generate cash flow. Benefits show March 16th down to the Gower Street United Church. We have Alan Doyle as the host. We have Kelly McMichael. She was the songwriter of the year. We have Nick Earl, who's rock artist of the year. And we have Rachel Cousins, solo artist of the year. Rhonda Tolkien actually um, works with Music NL and she had reached out to me. They're so hands-on whenever something is going on like this, especially um, non-for-profit or organizations. Music NL is, uh, they work really tight with things like that. And you know, when there's people in the community in need, Music NL knows that music is really healing to that. Rachel Cousins was also Music NL's 2022 Pop Artist of the Year. The 21-year-old is no stranger to the stage. She's been performing for years. Cousins didn't hesitate to lend her talents to the fundraiser. The one thing that I wish that I could give everybody is like meals and food. And, um, you know, we all do the food banks and things like that. And that's great. Um, but when, you know, an organization like this comes out and says we're really in need, we're overfilled with orders that we need to do and we need more food, we need more kitchen staff, whatever it may be, um, you know, we want to be there to help that out. Newfoundlanders really, you know, they help each other out, right? And uh, this show is kind of, you know, it's all Newfoundland artists and um, so hopefully people will get out and uh, support us. Williams is extremely hopeful that the event here at Gower Street United Church will sell out, raising some much needed funds for the organization. But there are harsh realities coming in 2023, but he says he's more determined than ever. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Well, speaking of music, the East Coast Music Awards has released this year's nominees. There are 58 nominations for local musicians this year in 15 categories. That's second only to Nova Scotia, and it's 13 more nominations than last year. Country singer Jason Benoit leads the way with five nominations, including Album of the Year. The ECMAs will be held in Halifax in May. Well, you're looking at a live shot of the Power Plex facility in St. John's where a lot of athletes are gathered tonight. They're getting pumped for next month's Canada Winter Games. I'll tell you all about it coming up. Well, a big swing in temperatures today. We'll see some mild conditions continue tomorrow and then even warmer as we head through Thursday and Friday. We'll get into the details coming up. And a little later, we'll tell you about a scary scam. One that involves your home being sold without you even knowing about it.
This weather forecast has been brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. Whatever you're up for this winter, discover experience packages at winterupnl.ca. The snow is definitely taking a hit mm -hmm. with uh, the rain that we had, and now today was a really mild day. Yeah, and I think the wind really helped with that overnight tonight. We saw some pretty gusty winds topped out at 100 kilometers per hour in oh, St. John's wow. overnight. So we do have a little bit more wind in the forecast as we head through the next couple of days. But uh, yeah, today was very mild. Let's, yeah. let's take a look at those daytime highs this afternoon. Uh, about six degrees in St. John, seven in Bonavista and Marystown topped out at eight. That's where most of the mild air is, but it really continued right across the province, uh, right across the island, I should say. Uh, five degrees in Cornerbrook today, except dipping into some of that cooler air up across the northern peninsula and along the strait somewhere between uh, about one or two degrees through the day. And then even considering uh, we are in the almost the end of January, temperatures very mild up across the big land as well. Minus eight today in Lab City and uh, the cold spot was in Churchill Falls as well as Nain at minus 11. Now what we have going on is an area of low pressure. It's racing northward now, so it's pulling all the precipitation with it. That rain generally ended uh, earlier today, but we do have some snow still along the coastal areas of Labrador. It's just on its way out now, and uh, that will continue to do that as we head through the uh, next couple of hours. But those temperatures are on the way down, so down to uh, already below zero for the west coast, and that will be the trend right across the island tonight. And then even up across Labrador, minus 12 right now in Lab City with a wind chill feeling more like minus 22. But as we head through the night tonight, temperatures dipping to about minus 28. We may even see that dip a little bit lower into the minus 30s. Uh, but overall, all the cold air certainly there for you with those uh, winds out of the north northwest between 30 and 50 kilometers per hour. We will see a pretty significant wind chill overnight tonight as well. And then as far as the island is concerned, temperatures dipping into the minus single digits with some gusty winds through the night. And uh, that it means that with all this melt and uh, pockets of water, pools of water, that will likely turn into a skating rink. So definitely keep that in mind. Uh, have some salt on hand, and if you have that snow in piles that you kind of want to get rid of, it's a good idea to do that before the temperatures uh, really solidify that through the overnight. Just taking a look at the satellite right now, there's a few flurries popping up, uh, but overall pretty quiet evening. And that will be the story as we head through the night tonight. We may see a few pockets of flurries, but nothing in the way of uh, accumulation except along the west coast as we see these onshore flurries continue and particularly in the higher elevations, uh, even as we head into the morning hours really into the morning hours so though for the west coast. Snow still possible for coastal areas of Labrador, but that should pull out as the day goes on. And really most of the afternoon looking pretty nice. We'll see some peaks of sun through central. Same thing for eastern Newfoundland and then up across the big land as well, except in the southeast. You'll stay cloudy through the afternoon into the evening hours. That's when we'll start to see that clearing trend. And then we uh, watch our next weather maker move in as we head through the overnight hours and into the first half of Thursday by way of clouds first. And then eventually we'll see that precipitation move in. That will happen in the afternoon on Thursday, starting as snow and then eventually transition to rain, which will be heavy at times again through the day on Thursday. This will be a fairly significant snow event for those of you across the big land as well uh, through the afternoon. The other thing that will accompany this will be some winds after tomorrow. Uh, and then into the first half of Thursday, we'll actually see uh, relief from the winds. But by the time the afternoon rolls around, we're going to see that uh, wind pick up really pick up uh, as we head into the evening hours on Thursday and through the overnight with those winds gusting as high as 100 kilometers per hour. Looks like my uh, map is stuck at the moment, but especially in those exposed areas on the west coast. There we go, starting to pick up there on Thursday and then into Friday morning. Uh, we'll continue to see those strong wind gusts. So it will be uh, definitely, you know, winds gusting over 100 kilometers per hour, at least for the west coast and then parts of the Avalon as well. Here's your temperatures for your Wednesday. Now, uh, the Buren Peninsula as well as the Avalon will hover around the zero degree mark, maybe a degree above uh, with some sunshine, which will be very nice and will again lead to some more melting. Uh, we'll stay in and below zero 
104 Central in the West Coast with that chance of flurries more numerous on the West Coast and those winds out of the Northwest between 30 and 50 kilometers per hour. Your temperature in Cartwright will start chilly at minus 12 and it will continue to drop as the day goes on uh, with that chance of flurry sticking around as well and then into the minus 20s uh, for Northern and Western Labrador. Now this cold air is going to stick around. Get into those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, there's plenty of excitement at the Newfoundland and Labrador Sports Center, known as the Powerplex tonight. Premier Andrew Fury and others are part of a rally at the St. John's facility. The goal is to get people pumped for the upcoming Canada Winter Games. The games are being held on Prince Edward Island starting February 18th, but tonight all of the attention is on the Powerplex. That's where here and now's Mike Moore is with some other people who are gearing up for the games. Mike. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm here with two people right now who are involved with Team Newfoundland and Labrador this year. And Gary, I just want to start with you. What's the mood like in here? How excited is everybody to be back? Well, it's the mood here is electrifying. Uh, we've got over 250 athletes here, premiers here, flag bearers announced, clothing revealed. So everyone's very excited. And talking to PEI today, uh, two storm days. So we're excited with the snow on the ground over there. So everyone is looking forward to getting going. And it's an event that's going to be played out over two weeks. Um, you know, what can we expect from it? Yeah, so we're two weeks. We kick off February the 18th uh, in PEI with opening ceremonies. Uh, first week sports uh, running right through to March the 6th. Um, of course, we, uh, we don't like to talk about medals too much. Uh, we did well in 2022, but uh, we're excited. Uh, there's some uh, good results, I think, on the horizon as we look forward to getting going. It's been a long time with the COVID. Uh, many of these teams here, uh, some have started as long as four years ago in their preparation, team selections and uh, mental training. And I just want to bring Jeremy into this. Hi, Jeremy. Um, so you're competing this year. Uh, what event are you competing in? Uh, I competed again, like, uh, uh, wheelchair racing and uh, skiing and basketball. And, and it, I understand it's your fifth uh, Canada Games. What does it mean to be representing Team Newfoundland and Labrador again? Um, I've been representing, uh, I'm proud to represent Newfoundland and Labrador and uh, prepare for the uh, long journey coming. And, well, I want to thank you both for joining me. Good luck in PEI in February on the 18th. And back to you, Carolyn. That's here and now's Mike Moore reporting live. Well, let's stay with sports. Every Sunday morning, a group in the Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia hits the ice for hockey practice. But this weekly gathering is about more than just the sport itself. This program was created to help black athletes access hockey. The CBC's Colleen Jones has that story. Right in early Sunday morning, these hockey players from grade primary to grade eight are honing their skills. Amere Lamy is six years old. I like that I can skate super fast. Watching in the warm room, his grandmother Darlene. My grandchild looks around, he, he's usually every day the only person of colour in his class. That's his experience, he lives in a community that uh, where it's rare to see other people of colour. And so when he comes here, he automatically, and you can see the difference in the children's faces, they, it's an automatic feeling of acceptance. She's sitting beside James Desmond. Three of his kids are out on the ice. Have them feel like they can shine unconditionally because everybody else is around them is shining too. So I really like that. Who doesn't want kids to shine? And that's what this hockey program now in its second year is designed to do. I'm at the West Hans Sports Complex and right at center ice, the words equity and diversity. Ian Shaw skates over that to talk to me. When I was growing up, there weren't really a lot of individuals that looked like me that were out there. It's good to, that the program is here so that kids can have the opportunity. Three of his children are in the program and he's relieved they can look out on the ice and see someone who looks like them. But beyond hockey, by coming here Sunday morning, there's a positive spin-off back at the school. Self-esteem, it gives them the, the, the self-worth and that they can accomplish anything they want to accomplish and that's what they work on. So that's what I love about it, and a sense of community. Mikhail Rack is a grade 12 student at Horton High. He left hockey for basketball, partly because of the lack of diversity in the sport. 
He volunteers here Sundays. Something that when Steve told me about, like it would have been very helpful to have when I was learning how to play the game and like just having the sense of community and knowing that like there's other like black kids and stuff that are interested in playing hockey would have been really helpful for me. They first came, they couldn't even walk in the hallway. Uh, we had to teach them how to put their skates on. Christina McBride is one of the many people central to making all of this happen. So we really want to start it here with development, uh, provide an opportunity, uh, promote racial pride with our students so they know about black hockey and black hockey players. Go score a goal for us. Do it. You can do it. You can do it. Lawrence Parker is a school support worker. Just to be there mainly to tie skates. Uh, I can skate a little bit or whatever. That's why I'm not on the ice now. It's but a cheerleader. Well, I'm a cheerleader, yeah. Hockey of all the sports. Um, we are trying to flood the, the, the ice with black people so that we can reduce the racism within the sport. Of the many life lessons they learn, when you fall down, you need to get back up. Destiny's just learned how to do that on her own. Meanwhile, in the locker room after... Nothing comes easy in life. It's a pep talk for the kids from Coach Steve. No excuses. If you're out in the community and you're thinking about doing something negative, we have to have you say in your mind to stop. No, it's wrong. Hockey lessons and life lessons. They hope this program is a change maker. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Windsor. Being in a room where there's so many other people that need help, um, it can be discouraging. Well, as the province prepares to move mental health and addiction services to the Health Sciences Centre, concerns are being raised by someone who has first-hand experience with the system. That story is next.
Changes that are coming to emergency mental health services in St. John's are raising concerns with some mental health advocates. The new mental health and addictions facility will be located at the Health Sciences Center. It will be integrated with the newly renovated emergency room that's under construction right now. Eastern Health says that means both mental health emergencies and physical emergencies will be assessed in the same general emergency room. Now, Eastern Health says Bringing these people together will help reduce the stigma associated with mental health treatment. It says mental health is health. Joining me now is Sarah Hillier, who's a mental health advocate in Churchill Falls. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So what did you think when you heard about the changes coming to emergency mental health care in St. John's? Uh, personally, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, I do understand the kind of thought of mental health is health. It absolutely is. Um, but I just think that comes also with being sensitive to the needs of mental health and how to appropriately address um, emergencies, especially. It's, it's pretty, um, it's a sensitive thing. So I think approaching it with sensitivity is the main um, goal. Mm -hmm. And I know you have firsthand experience with this. You've sought emergency mental health care at the Waterford Hospital in the past. How do you think that experience would have been different if you had to go to a general ER along with people who are experiencing physical emergencies? Personally, for me, honestly, I don't think I would have went, um, period. I just don't think that I would have put myself in a situation where I am also adding to the um, stress and the amount of work for um, general emergencies, of, you know, um, I think I've mentioned before that being in a position where you're in a mental health crisis, it's really hard to advocate for yourself. So even just going to an emergency room is a huge step, um, which is really hard to take. And I think adding that pressure of being in a room where there's so many other people that need help, um, it can be discouraging because, um, like I said, you're not in a place to advocate for yourself. You're in a place where you're struggling to even think that you deserve help. Um, so just adding to that, I think I, I personally probably would never have gone. So you think that it could potentially be a deterrence for some people? Absolutely, yeah. And I mentioned that uh, Eastern Health believes this change will help reduce stigma. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, personally, I think that it uh, absolutely has the chance of backfiring, um, honestly, in that situation. Just because, again, um, mental health emergencies can look very different, um, and they just require privacy and sensitivity. And I think that um, having people who are in crisis in the same kind of setting, um, again, you can be reacting in that mental health crisis um, in a very different way from physical crisis um, or, or emergencies. It's just, um, it's much more to me personal. Um, and I think that reducing stigma does not mean lumping everyone together. Um, it's just reducing stigma means approaching it the way that it needs to be approached um, sensitively and, and in a very timely manner. I mean, I think that's very important because the crisis um, is uh, it's, it's, it's very like in that moment you need that help right then and there um, and without that kind of immediate access to someone or to privacy um, it, it can just it can make it go worse honestly and I don't think that that uh, will help people who don't understand mental illness um, I, I think that it, it could go the opposite way for sure and you mentioned privacy there. Um, what do you think should be done to make the healthcare experience better for someone who is experiencing a mental health crisis? Um, I think that it would be extremely important to have a separate area that you can take people um, who are in mental health crisis, um, having separate rooms. I mean, when I have um, utilized the emergency services at the Waterford, um, you kind of immediately get put in a separate room. From either by yourself or you do have somebody else um, there with you. Um, and I think that that just helps kind of, you don't feel like all eyes are on you. You can just sit in that moment um, and be able to focus on just getting through each second, each moment. And I think that that is extremely important in 
um, navigating through a mental health crisis. Well, Sarah Hillier, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on this topic. Thank you for having me. The Patel family didn't survive walking across this snowy Manitoba field into the United States. There is new information tonight about a human smuggling investigation that has spanned three countries. Charges are laid, but not here in Canada, which is a big part of the investigation. It's a scenario many homeowners can barely imagine. Having your home mortgaged without your knowledge or even sold out from under you. The CBC has uncovered new details about a scam, one that has ties to organized crime. Farah Morali explains. A red flag right away. Mm -hmm. okay. In this file folder, photocopies of countless fake IDs, allegedly used to commit real estate fraud. Private investigator Brian King has been hired by a title insurance company to find those responsible. Right now we have 30 active files, at least 30. And that's just here in the GTA? Yeah. Many of King's cases involve individuals using fake ID to impersonate a legitimate homeowner. 
They then place a new or second mortgage on the home and take off with the proceeds. He also has cases where people use fake ID to rent homes. Once they get the keys, others impersonate the real homeowners and sell the property. Again, taking off with the money. Typically, it's organized crime that's behind it. The people that actually um, are front-facing on the frauds, the people using the IDs, posing as the homeowners, are not the ultimate people that are receiving the funds. They're usually paid stand-ins. Of King's 30-plus cases, four involve a home sold without the owner's knowledge. But there are more than that. There are three other title insurance companies in Canada, in addition to the one King works for. They step in when these types of frauds happen to cover costs and get the home back to the true owner. These companies tell CBC News they too have seen cases of stolen homes, and not just here in Toronto. They're largely happening in the Greater Toronto Area and the Greater Vancouver Area. Experts say the number of cases started picking up in late 2019 and estimate title insurance companies have lost around $200 million in title and mortgage fraud cases since then. We went from zero of those claims to now many dozens of those claims. Um, it's not sustainable over the long term, so we really need the whole real estate industry working together to weed out these fraudsters. We're seeing a level of sophistication in that area that we've never seen before. It's very organized. Given the volume of cases, some are wondering why there's been so little attention. We were told over and over and over again that we were the only people. This was such a rare situation. Melissa Walsh's 95-year-old great-uncle nearly lost his home in Toronto's East End after fraudsters used fake IDs to rent his home that impersonated him to list it for sale. Hearing that this has happened to potentially over 30 other families is hard to wrap your head around. And again, I don't understand why this hasn't been discussed. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, with the recent rise in cases, investigators like King have their work cut out for them. So it's a, um, a, a very um, painstaking process to try and understand who's behind it. Quietly tracking down those responsible for a sophisticated scam that's growing. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. Well, CBC News has learned new information about one of the men who was part of a group with an Indian family who froze to death on the Manitoba-U.S. border last year. It's part of an investigation spanning three countries. Charges against alleged human uh, smuggling rather, have been laid in the U.S. and India, but not yet in Canada. Karen Pauls has more. The Patel family didn't survive walking across this snowy Manitoba field into the United States, but seven other people in their group did. Police in three countries are still trying to figure out how they got there. It's a complex investigation. Um, uh, be assured we're, we're working on it. One of the men who made it across is now facing forgery charges in India, accused by police of using fraudulent and bogus documents to get an admission to Loyalist College in southern Ontario. Based on that, police say he got a student visa and went to Canada with the intention of entering illegally into the United States. No one from Loyalist College would do an interview, but a spokesman sent a statement saying the individual was never registered as a student at Loyalist College, however did submit an application. Documents related to this application were shared with the RCMP and the college is cooperating fully with the investigation. I can um, confirm that we have been um, talking with Gujarat police through our liaison officer and they did request us uh, for, for some documents from Loyalist College and we have received those documents and shared them. But Manitoba RCMP won't say if they've asked other Canadian schools for documents involving other people in the group. It's all, uh, you know, part of the bigger investigation. It's ripe for fraud. This immigration lawyer is not surprised to hear Canada's student visa process is being allegedly used by international human smugglers. It undermines the integrity of the, of, the, of, the, of the whole program and the whole system. And, but no one wants to take the steps necessary to prevent it. Yeah, she debuted it. Oh, good. This lawyer says one of the problems is different cultural norms, standards and expectations. Sometimes we get uh, an applicant who says to us, give us a document checklist and we will just get you whatever documents that you need. And we have to go back to them and say, look, this is Canada, we need genuine documents. 
Police in India say they are still investigating, waiting for information from the RCMP, the Canadian Embassy and Canadian Universities. As for the man connected with Loyalist College, U.S. law enforcement authorities say he was deported, but they won't say where he was sent. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Well, Ticketmaster is in the hot seat today in Washington. A U.S. Senate committee is grilling the ticket giant after its botched sale of Taylor Swift concert tickets last fall. It's investigating whether the company holds too much power over sales. These issues are symptomatic, I think, of a larger problem. The ticketing and live entertainment markets lack competition and they are dominated by a single entity. In November, the site crashed during a pre-sale event for Swift's upcoming tour dates. Many people lost tickets after waiting hours in the online queue. The company said its site was overwhelmed by fans and bot attacks. Ticketmaster is the world's largest seller of tickets and processes about 500 million tickets each year in more than 30 countries. In 2010, it merged with Live Nation, a company that produces live shows and festivals. About 70% of sales for major concert venues in the U.S. are sold through Ticketmaster. It is now 90 seconds to midnight. Well, as if you didn't have enough to worry about, a group of atomic scientists unveiled today where they've set the doomsday clock for this year. It's been around since 1947 and is meant to be a visual sign of how close the world is to global catastrophe. And they believe humanity is closer to the end of the world than ever before, largely because of the nuclear threat from the war in Ukraine. We'll be right back with Ashley's long range forecast, maybe.
up for a look at the long range forecast. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier that there's a bunch of rain on the way and a bunch of snow for Labrador. Yeah, we have a couple special weather statements in effect already for the West Coast parts of Labrador as well. And that uh, is all going to change as we head into uh, Thursday. Let's take a look at what's going on at the future tracker as we head through uh, the evening hours on Wednesday and then the first half of Thursday. This is when the system is going to move in. So we'll see snow spread across uh, most of the West Coast and south coast through the afternoon and eventually that will make its way towards Labrador. Now some heavy snow expected. Uh, we could be talking about 25 or more centimeters uh, through the day on Thursday. And then it starts to snow across the island. We'll probably see some, we will see some accumulation by this as well. And then it'll trans over, trans transition through to rain uh, through the afternoon. Temperatures are going to warm up quite dramatically as well. Two to five degrees across the province, uh, at least across the south coast through the daytime. And then as that warm air continues further north through the evening and overnight, these temperatures are really going to skyrocket. They'll sit somewhere between uh, even seven, eight, nine degrees as we head into the early morning hours on Friday. Now that will move through fairly quickly in behind this. We've got some colder air, which will change all of that rain back over to snow uh, for the west coast and then again continuing across the island. This will also be as, or across uh, coastal areas of Labrador. This will also be a fairly windy day, as I showed you a little bit earlier, with those winds gusting, especially on the west coast with those areas that are prone to southeasterlies. You could be seeing those gusts in excess of 120, even 140 kilometers per hour. Uh, the further east you go, though, that should be around 100, maybe even 120 in some of those exposed areas. Uh, into the evening hours, that will move off, though, but uh, take a look at these temperatures. Like I was saying, 5 to 7 degrees. This is just where your afternoon temperatures will sit. They will be a bit higher earlier in the morning across Labrador, especially for the West. Temperatures are much colder into the minus 20s and then hovering around the zero degree mark, maybe a degree below uh, for coastal areas. Long range forecast showing a dip again as we head into Saturday and then uh, Sunday around two degrees, but we'll see some flurries move right back in for St. John's in Eastern Newfoundland. Central, you're looking at a pretty nice stretch of weather for the weekend. That will be snow for those of you in Western Newfoundland at least some onshore flurries and then for Labrador temperatures uh, hovering between 10 minus 10 minus 12 a little bit of a warm up roller coaster ride for Western Labrador and then back down for your Sunday. Just wanted to share this uh, quick shot with you. This is a winter sunrise in Twillingate. Tara shared that great shot with us. If you have any weather photos, send them to Facebook, Twitter or email them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Oh, beautiful, Tara. Thank you so much for Great that. Great sunset. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is it for us on this Tuesday evening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Hope you can join us again tomorrow. Good night.